So today, uh, our topic is uh, search advertising fraud, and I brought a book with me, and uh, this was really key to the case study I'm going to talk about, and, uh, but I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, I'm Senior Pro Program Manager for Traffic Quality Strategy and Outreach uh, at Microsoft, and uh, our team deals with uh, specifically click fraud right now on the, uh, on the Bing and Yahoo Alliance uh, search network. So let's just get right into it. So what I want to take you to take away today, three things. First of all, learn the angles, and that's an American saying, and when you, whenever you use the word angles, it means something negative. In other words, someone's trying to do something deceitful. So what I want you to do is learn how, what kind of fraud is out there, how the fraud works, the different MOs, and so you can be aware of it at the very least. Second, protect yourself. There are, there are a few thing, basic things you can do, especially if you're marketers out there um, running uh, SEM uh, campaigns. Uh, that you can do to help mitigate the risk of fraud. Now, there's no guarantee that uh, some of your spend will be compromised by fraudulent activity, but at least you'll be able to catch it sooner and uh, you'll be able to report it to the search engine provider and, and help, they'll help uh, resolve it and, and credit, make a credit adjustment for it, that traffic. And then finally, Microsoft is committed to fighting uh, click fraud and other types of fraud. That's something in our team, which has grown from four that I led a year ago, and now we're over 30. And, and that just shows you how big the problem is in fraud. So uh, fraud is something we're all familiar with. It's nothing new. Back in the old days, uh, before the internet, uh, you had uh, ID theft still happened, but people were stealing mail out of the mailboxes. They were stealing uh, information out of the garbage. Took, in the US anyway, your social security number and used that to create uh, new identities. Uh, now online, that's nothing new either. You have the, uh, the classic phishing um, scams where they make you think you're signing up, uh, you're, you're uh, confirming your password for your bank account, uh, when in fact you're giving up your information. They go ahead and compromise and steal all your money. Uh, you also have lotto scams. In Europe, there are actual legitimate lotteries that were run for an international audience where you can win lots of money, but that was also uh, uh, taken and used against uh, naive people uh, who would send in money thinking that they have a 1 in 10 chance of winning a big prize, and in fact, it was just a scam. And then finally, the most famous was the 419 uh, Nigerian scam, where some secretary to the treasurer in Nigeria would send you an email, tell you that we have lots of money, it's locked up, we need your help to get to it, please send a thousand bucks and we'll give you 1% of that $300 million that's locked away. And you wouldn't believe that this got the most media attention in uh, the United States and North America of any scam. So many people fell for this. Uh, it, it was unbelievable. The FBI was uh, actually traveled and worked with the Nigerian government. And, and this is a full underground um, uh, industry, uh, the 419 Nigerian scam. Still going strong. So be before we go on to click and search advertising, I want to talk about display a little bit. Uh, Display advertising, the first banner ad was posted, this is uh, some debate, but either 1994, between 94 and 98. Some people say Wired Magazine Online was the first to have a commercial banner ad. Others say there was something earlier in 1994. Uh, but the reason we're not going to cover it is a, a couple things. Where search is really concentrated into a few big providers, um, you obviously, Google being the biggest, display is still, hasn't, is still figuring it out. They're still trying to figure out a way to get that television money uh, into display, uh, which is a, more of a branding experience than a, than a uh, performance experience. And just to give you an idea how much battle is going on over display right now, this is a chart by a consulting company, and these are all companies that work in the advertising technology, display advertising technology space. I mean, there are literally probably 100 companies there. And, and I've read recently more uh, media technology companies are getting funding, so they're all trying to get a piece of that pie. Several of these have been uh, bought up already, and uh, uh, even though we, our team knows we'll have to deal with display at some point, it's just not a big uh, uh, fraud threat right now. So we're going to go on to the search engines. Now the big three, Google globally is the biggest by far in almost every market. There's a few markets where it's behind, uh, but uh, the, the big three I'm going to refer to going forward is the North, for the North American market, which are Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Now, that's not to say that there are other big search engines that are taking advantage of uh, local cultures and language differences like uh, Baidu, and I looked up a few, and, and tell me if you've heard of these, uh, Guruji and Onyomi, Onyomo, which were Indian, uh, supposedly, but they were, everything's in beta, apparently. All the, all the Indian search engines are in beta, I found, when I was doing some research. Uh, but, so we'll be talking about the three big ones. 
So let's talk about the ecosystem, uh, the actors uh, that work in the search engine marketing space. First of all, you have traffic. You have the humans who actually click on the ads to try to find value out of the search engine. Uh, these people are real. Uh, they buy things, uh, they convert, which is the most important, they click on ads. However, there's another part of traffic that's the nefarious side, and these are what we call uh, uh, traffic uh, without any commercial intent. They can be human, such as click farms, where people are paid to click on ads. Uh, they're not paid to buy anything, so there's rarely any conversions related to that. And then there's, of course, computers that can be since they're machines, it can be very scaled out very widely, and uh, you know, we refer them to, and typically they are actually botnets. So that's the traffic side. Now these people, they visit publishers, and publishers can be uh, anything from owned and operated, such as Google itself, it could be Yahoo Finance, it could be MSN, um, but uh, these big search engines have so many visitors, uh, they need more inventory to satisfy the demand. So what they do is they go out and they make uh, deals with other uh, properties, and in this case, the, the bigger properties, Comcast, YouTube, Wall Street Journal, Indian Times, they, uh, India Times, they, they, make, they strike deals with the Googles and the Bings and the, and the Yahoos uh, so that every time an ad is clicked on, they get a cut of that revenue. Typically, it's 80-20, where the, the syndicated publisher will get 80% of the dollar and then, uh, or the rupee, and the, uh, the platform, the search engine, will get 20%. And then on the other end, you have, oh, then you have sub-syndication. This is where a lot of the fraud uh, uh, originates. Uh, when the syndicated parties, when they run out of inventory, uh, but you still have the search engines willing to serve ads, they contract out with sub-syndicators. And this is where it gets very gray, uh, because some of these sub-syndicators are affiliate programs, they're... They're, they're, some of them have really high reputations, some of them are very, very scammy, and it's a very dangerous space. And I would love to see the sub-syndication world uh, wiped out and, and uh, put away and we not deal with it, but unfortunately it does make money. And at the, at the end of the day, business is about making money. So our job as a team is to fight as hard as we can to mitigate fraud and stop it where we find it. Then we get over the advertisers. You have the big global brands uh, as well as the local and small businesses, which is the, which is the uh, latest frontier in terms of search engine marketing for the search engines. They want to go out uh, partnering with aggregators, with the yellow pages, with local.com, and, and using their sales forces to reach all these local uh, uh, businesses and, uh, again, uh, create revenue from that. And then finally, you have the search engine itself, which I refer to as the marketplace. Two big players here. You have Google with AdSense, uh, which is uh, their syndicated uh, product, and then AdWords, which is all the ads on their search engine itself. And for the Search Alliance, uh, we've got the same thing. You can have ads on Bing or Yahoo, proper, owned and operated, or any uh, number of syndicated or the eventually sub-syndicated partners. So that's the ecosystem. I'm going to talk about a case study as a, as a, as a way to bring it all together. And uh, this case study, uh, the event that started it happened back in March of 2008. Two verticals, advertising verticals. One is, believe it or not, World of Warcraft. How many of you heard of that game? Online multiplayer game. I don't know, how, and, and I don't mean to insult anybody if you play it, but people spend hours and hours and hours in front of their computers playing this virtual game. And in this virtual game, the way you buy weapons and you, you buy shields and spells and whatever else you can buy is using a world of War of Worldcraft gold. And to get this gold, you have to fight dragons, you have to, you have to kill the enemy, and you earn it little by little. Well, in North America, in, in the suburbs of, of New Jersey and Los Angeles, you have very rich, spoiled kids who don't want to have to work to get their gold. So there's an entire market based out of China where Chinese uh, gold farms, if you will, the, there's, there's people playing the game and all they do is play the game to collect gold. And uh, just, like a, just like a cartel, they move their gold up the chain to a, to a set of brokers. And these brokers then turn around and sell this gold to those spoiled kids in the United States. And at one point, gold was actually worth more than the US dollar. That's how popular this game is and how uh, such high demand for this gold and all the benefits of gaining it are. So you have that vertical and there's several players, who, several brokers in that vertical that uh, buy ad space on Bing. The other vertical, and, and you can't tell from this graphic, but it's auto insurance. 
Auto insurance is another uh, vertical that they have a high cost per click because they, uh, they're looking for leads all the time. And, and the reason why is they have a high uh, lifetime value of a customer. So they can grab a customer for auto insurance. They can upsell to homeowner's insurance. They can upsell to uh, person, you know, uh, jewelry insurance, a whole lot of things. So it's really important. They fight tooth and nail over every customer. So in March 2008, all was well for both of these verticals. Then all of a sudden, things went terribly wrong. Clicks started increasing, and their budgets collapsed. And all of these clients, they have budgets. You know, they, uh, maybe it's a million dollars a month for the big auto insurance uh, clients. And uh, typically, they, they, they have expectations that's based on normal behavior, organic, uh, well, easily forecasted behavior that they'll go through that million dollars pretty evenly. Uh, but what happened was, the Clicks started increasing quickly, the budgets collapsed, and then for some of these advertisers, uh, especially in the auto insurance side, their budgets disappeared, they were used up. So what happened is they went dark. And uh, $1.4 million of advertising budget for the auto insurance vertical was gone like that. And just some numbers behind that, for some of these uh, advertisers, there were 1.6 million clicks, made over 48 hours, and all of those were zero real people. These were computers doing all these clicks. We found out. We didn't find out instantly. That was part of the forensic investigation. So how did this happen? Well, you're going to have to wait, because I'm going to talk about uh, the, 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 the price of click fraud. It's alive and well, and a third-party company called Click Forensics, which uh, deals specifically in click fraud with other advertisers as their clients, uh, release a report every quarter, and the latest one should be due out any time because it is January for the, for the Q4 and the entire year. But for Q3, what they reported was, uh, just to give you some uh, reference point, in Q3 of 2009, uh, the percentage of all clicks that were fraudulent, they reported as 14.1%. In Q3 of 2010, it rose to 22.3%. So that is a 50% increase in the number of fraudulent clicks in just a year. So clearly, this is a problem. Uh, my beef with the entire uh, search engine marketing industry, uh, when you look at conferences, is click fraud is rarely talked about these days. It was a big topic of conversation back when Yahoo and Google had class action lawsuits in, in the United States uh, filed against them, and everyone wanted to know what these search engines are doing about click fraud. For whatever reason, once they were settled, uh, people moved on to other topics, and granted, they were more important, but what I think happened is, Four years ago, everyone was hyper-focused on cost per click. Now the industry has matured and everyone's focused on the conversion. So when you work with customers, it's not, you don't talk about with end customers. You don't talk about uh, with Joe the plumber about how much his clicks are going to cost. You talk about how many visits to his website he's going to get, how many phone calls he's going to get, and what's the cost and the ROI for that. So I think for that reason, click fraud isn't at the forefront. That said, it is costing those end customers uh, higher uh, or lower ROI and higher cost per conversions because this is biting into that, uh, those dollars, those media dollars. So how much revenue is at risk? Uh, there's no concrete numbers, but taking a look at the data out there, we can take some educated guesses. So for annual digital ad revenue for the year, uh, based on taking first half of 2010, extrapolating to second half as being the same, is $24.8 billion. And this includes all digital advertising, social media, display, search, everything. And of all that uh, spend, 47% of it is going to search. Uh, most of that's Google, clearly. Uh, but still, that's uh, almost half of that $24 billion. So if you take a, you saw the last slide, 21% uh, click fraud uh, rate. Now I'm taking, this number you see here is based on a 10% fraud rate. So even with very conservative number, cutting it in the half, and I do that because that number that they report doesn't, it's taken from the advertiser's data. What they don't have insight into is what the search engines themselves do to combat fraud. So for example, if the advertisers see that uh, 20 of their clicks uh, were, were driven by bots, what they don't realize is the, as that Microsoft or Google or Yahoo had already filtered out half of them, and, and they weren't being billed with them. Uh, but they wouldn't see that in their log. So let's take half of that as being handled by the search engines. That still leaves $1.4 billion in, in your spend as marketers going to fraud, going to the bad guys. That's a lot of, lot of money. 
And, and where is this trend coming from? And this is a small, very uh, little graphic. But what I have circled there, that line, is the, the percentage of buys, of media buys that are uh, based on performance and, and mostly you know, cost per click. And because it's cost per click, there's a lot more opportunity to commit fraud and profit from it than there is with the descending line, which is a CPM model, and the very bottom line, which is nothing, is a hybrid model of some combination of cost per acquisition plus uh, CPM typically. So it's a problem. It's something that can't be ignored, in, in my humble opinion. Next, let's talk about the different types of online uh, advertising fraud for search. Uh, you have account fraud and credit card fraud. This happens at the front door. Uh, you have click fraud, and then you have malware. Uh, these are the three types of search uh, marketing fraud that my team deals with all the time. Uh, the first one we'll talk about quickly is account and credit card fraud. Uh, it's all about laundering stolen credit cards. So the carters who go ahead and steal or buy in these dark black forms that are hard to get into because they're well monitored, they don't want the FBI infiltrating them, they don't want uh, uh, to have the spotlight on them, but you can trade uh, you can, you can buy stolen credit cards, and, and now not just the credit card number, but the address and the CVB2 number, which supposedly was invented to stop, uh, stop the ability to use the card unless you had the physical card, but that's not even the case anymore. So what they do is when they get these cards, they, they need to get something out of it. So they, they go on, uh, they create an account as a self-serve advertiser, then they bid, uh, uh, let's say, ringtones at $300 a click, which is an outrageous sum which no one else, no legitimate advertiser will, would actually do, but they don't care. It's not their money. And so they flood the, the, the uh, you know, their results are always on the top. And so real legitimate customers who want ringtones click on them, and then they go to the site, and they're actually, typically, they buy a real product, uh, but the click fraud, the, st the stolen card person using an affiliate program, to get revenue off of every one of those sales. So they're able to take, you know, for every $100 in stolen credit cards, they can get maybe 30 bucks out of it. So to them, that's a profitable business. Uh, another problem we have in this, in this area is hijacking trusted current accounts. So if you have uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, you know, they don't, they don't, they're not self-service. They have a huge account team. Uh, they're invoiced. Uh, if their account is compromised and no one catches it soon enough, they have, they have a credit limit that's basically unlimited. And the bad guys do the same thing. They go in and change all the keywords and all the, all the bids, and then again, lead the traffic to where they want to go to uh, affiliate programs and AdSense pages where they can make money off of advertising, et cetera. And then finally, uh, using high bid prices to create instant traffic. And, and that is an extension of the other two. So they get that instant traffic because they're at the top of the, top of the list, referring to the, the trusted uh, um, the pillars of trust, by the fact that you're at the top ad gives the people a sense of that since you're at the top, you must be one of the more, uh, the better companies I can trust. So they get this instant traffic and the consumers in the most part aren't, don't get screwed over unless there's malware on that landing page and then they do, which I'll talk about in malware. But, so that's account and credit card fraud. Uh, malware is another issue and uh, malware is used, it's the seed or the fruit from the poisonous tree uh, when malware is spread, a lot of time from display advertising, um, it creates, and, and any one of your machines could be a bot. They create bots that become part of a botnet. So how that works is the, the bad guy through a Trojan horse, whether it's a, a, a toolbar or free screen savers, uh, when you download a toolbar, it dumps this malware onto your machine, and over time, it creates a whole army of machines that have this, this code on, of this virus on the machine. Now, it's not doing anything to you. It's not stealing your personal information, but it's just sitting there ready to be activated. Then this guy, he gets into business. Now that he's made them all uh, bots, he then uh, puts on these dark forms. He offers his, his services. He says, I have 100,000 uh, node.net or botnet. Uh, who wants need of it? It's popular with spammers, but more and more it's being used by click fraudsters. And they'll pay a thousand bucks for uh, you know, X amount of clicks created from this botnet. So that, th this is how botnets are, are created, and uh, this is why we fight mal malware, why it's so important in, in our business. And then finally, the, uh, well, not finally, but the case study is about a different type of click fraud. But in publisher click fraud, uh, what happens here is you have the advertiser, they give the ad to the search engine. Uh, search engine then 
sends it off to the syndicators, uh, which, which display the ad in their content pages. And if they run out of uh, spots to put ads, they pull in the sub-syndicators uh, to provide traffic. And for, for most of them, they're legitimate. They're green light, users are clicking on those ads, they're getting the value that they paid for. But every once in a while, these sub-syndicators uh, will not be legitimate. And so they're using a, a botnet or it's a, a bad ad. So when the traffic comes back aggregately, it looks, it looks good, it's green. And so the advertisers pay what they're supposed to do based on that reported number of clicks. And you can see they're paying in rupees here. Um, they pay the, uh, the, the marketplace, and then in turn, the marketplace pays the split, the 80% of the 80-20, to the syndicators, and then they uh, split that with the sub-syndicator, so the bad guy actually collects money. Um, there's a lot of money to be made because when you're sending money out the door, uh, that is a big uh, incentive for somebody to try to grab onto it. And the second we send that out the door, we'll never see it again. So our job as a team is to catch that before that money goes out the door to pay these uh, bad guys. How did uh, these advertisers lose their budget so quickly? Uh, first of all, let's talk about the auction model. That's important to understanding this. Uh, so he here it is simplified. You start with a group of advertisers. In this case, I'm going to use travel advertisers as an example. Now, if you'll notice, there's a few other advertisers in there that just don't fit. But we'll get to that as we go through this. Second, uh, they're interested in buying ads when some, a user uh, types in the keyword travel. Uh, then they have to submit ads that have to be approved for that keyword. So they, uh, you know, they're book travel, travel Expedia, cheap air online official site. And then four, they make bids for clicks uh, at an, as in an auction. As you can see there, Orbitz, for some reason, bid only 12 cents, Expedia, 86 cents. Now this is the odd man out. You got free ringtones there bidding a buck twenty the most. So he's probably trying to get traffic uh, at this head keyword uh, term, which means head and tail means head is a very gets lots and lots of traffic. Tail are the keywords that don't get much because they're very obscure. So how do how do we determine what order these ads go in and which ones even make the cut? Is well you take the bid price for all of these. And then you, we, we make a quality score. It's based on relevance of the ad itself. It's based on relevance of the landing page. So uh, for example, ringtones are going to have a landing page that has nothing to do with travel. Even if their ad says, uh, buy ringtones that remind you of the tropics. Still, when you look at the landing page, it's going to get a low score. So uh, the quality score, you add the two together through a formula, and then you end up with the auction results. And in this case, uh, Expedia made the the top uh, ads and the others in the simplified case uh, just went down on the side uh, bar. Normal traffic activity uh, for auto insurance is you have users, you have auto insurance, this is small, I apologize, but they're, uh, they have their ads there, uh, all the different auto insurance is based on their, their, their final scores, and humans are clicking on it, uh, and then they uh, convert, and the auto insurance companies you know, make money off of the conversions. This thing is building really fast. But what goes wrong is the clicks all of a sudden are going, they're clicking at an extraordinary rate, way more than any human could. And it all looks like it's coming from humans because they're so distributed from all these different bots, that's part of the botnet, that it depletes the ads, it gets lost in the middle of our, our, all these real people, these three blue boxes that are clicking. And at the end of the day, clicks go up, the budgets deplete, all those ads disappear because they have no more budget. That's what's called going dark. And what you have left at the very top is you see a little ad there. And this site you see is the actual site in the lawsuit that was left that when real users were clicking on this ad, because that's all that was left. Again, it was the top ad. And they had, it looked legitimate. But what this was was a lead generation site. So the uh, this, this defendant would take these users they, hit, they fill out a form, and what did he do? He sold it back to the advertisers that he just went, made go dark. So the guy was, it was a brilliant scheme. Fortunately, we caught up with him. It took a year. Um, and so who is behind this? That's what we want to know. Who is responsible? When legal heard about this, they decide this is a case that is ideal for us to go after. But before we get to that, let's talk about the search alliance. Uh, so uh, the search alliance is... You may have heard Yahoo and Microsoft announced it over a year ago. 
And basically, they decided that individually they can't go up against Google. Surprise! And so they decided by joining forces, they'd have a shot at, at perhaps uh, bridging that gap. And in conjunction with working together on the Bing uh, organic and Bing consumer side, Bing has been making huge strides in, in features. Uh, ever since uh, the president of the online division came over from Yahoo, Chi Lu, who only sleeps four hours a night, and that's true, I don't know how he does it, they've added feature after feature after feature that have been upping in Google. Because Google, as you know, is very simple, and everyone likes that, and, and it has its utility. It's, it's perfect for a lot of things, but Microsoft was betting that with a, little more, a few more features, they can, they can bring in, steal some consumers that uh, would want a decision engine, as they say, over a, a search engine. Um, so Google owns 65% of the market, as we know. Uh, Bing and Yahoo split the remaining business, and at the time I put this together, it was 12% Bing, which was, had made a huge advance from an earlier, a year before that, and Yahoo had 17% and is slowly shrinking over time. Uh, the alliance creates a single platform, so uh, Yahoo manages, they split up all the clients, Yahoo manages all the big clients, all the premium clients, and Microsoft takes the role as the technology platform, and therefore the clients they have are all the self-serve clients that come in through the UI using credit cards to buy ads. And uh, this created a better consumer experience because the complaints we heard time and time again is, is everyone uses Google, but they have to choose between Bing and Yahoo because they're two completely different systems and it's just not worth it to learn both of them individually. So by combining forces using a single platform, Microsoft Ad Center, uh, the migration for North America completed in October and was a success, fortunately. Been working on that for the past, past year. Uh, but as a 30% total combined market share now, or soon to be, we make a much larger target for frauds. Uh, our team uh, works on using the, the, the fraud funnel philosophy. So at the front door of the fraud funnel, you have our uh, engineering team. You have algorithmic filtration. Now, this is both real-time filtration and this is offline uh, analysis. And they look at every click. They look at the IP address. They look at the user agent. They, they look at patterns. They make decisions. And quickly, they uh, either in real-time or over the next few hours, they decide if if this is something that should be billed or not for the client. If, uh, if it's fraud, it's called an invalid, unbillable click, and it gets discarded, user doesn't get billed for it, or the, the advertiser, and if it is billable, it moves through and it goes into their reports, and eventually they'll get billed, they'll, get, they'll have to pay for that. At the other end, you've got, the end we don't like to see is escalations from advertisers. This is when the advertiser notices something's wrong, and they cut a ticket, they let their AM know, account manager know, and it comes to our team to do the investigation. Now, we, we don't like this to happen because it means they notice something's wrong. And this is, what, this is what got Google and Yahoo in trouble with the class action lawsuit, is they didn't pay enough attention to these uh, advertisers who were complaining about uh, these clicks that appeared to be uh, not real people. So uh, we, we have a team of now we're up to 30, and a good half of them are investigators uh, dedicated to escalations from advertisers. Now, the middle part, what I call being proactively reactive, our team manages, and, and this is where the, the, the PhDs come in. Uh, they do signal processing. They look at all the data, whether it's filtered or not, and uh, they don't understand fraud necessarily, uh, the mechanics of fraud, but they can, they can find patterns. So they, they find these patterns and then they pass them over to our forensic investigators who make sense of the patterns. And so they'll deep dive. I mean, they'll go and look at the, the, uh, you know, the network layer. Uh, they'll look at the packet level. You know, they'll, they'll do stuff that I don't even understand, but they're just brilliant. They're, basically, we hire former hackers who uh, decide to you know, go legit. That, that's a good profile if they pass the background check, which many don't. Because if they've been in trouble with the law, we still can't hire them, even though they're brilliant. Um, so that's what our team does. Now back to our case study. Who is responsible? Well, the Digital Crimes Unit was interested as well. And uh, we started a uh, deep forensics investigation that lasted six months. And we started by noticing that uh, the user agents were all the same, which led to, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because it's very technical, um, which led to a certain set of IP addresses and then led to a whole set of proxies, which was a dead end for us. So the power of the John Doe lawsuit uh, allowed us to, uh, to file a lawsuit and therefore we subpoenaed the ISPs, connected the IP addresses uh, and confirmed that seven accounts were, uh, we confirmed them as being suspicious, which led to names 
of LLCs and actual people, and Eric Lamb was the top of the chain. Uh, and then, who is Eric Lamb? Well, we found out a lot of things after we got our investigators. They hit the pavement, and they found out some interesting information. We learned that he was from Shanghai, born and born there. Early on, he came to Vancouver, where he lived with his family. And we even have pictures of the condo he lived in. So, I mean, we were tracking this guy, waiting to serve these papers. The guy talked about himself all the time. So, if, <laughs> social networking made it easy to learn more about him. This is Eric Lam, and it's interesting reading. He's from uh, Guangzhou. I guess I thought it was Shanghai, but he's, he describes himself as a contrarian, preterist, non-Trinitarian dilettante, and a movie aficionado. And I disdain egoistic hedonism, yet he's frauding everybody. Uh, we found more information about his interests. We, we saw a picture of him as a kid waving to the camera. And this is public. He put it up himself, but his passport photo. <laughs> so we nailed this guy. So with that, thanks for listening and feel free to contact me and I'll do the same. I'll put some cards on the, on the table there, but I appreciate your time.